Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the fantastic Phil Dunster to talk all about Ted Lasso season three. And one of the things that I love that you've done with Jamie as a character over the seasons is you've taken him on such a journey of, of growth and evolution, but you've still always kept him really true to who he was at the beginning. So he's still a character that has elements of the pride and the narcissism that we met at the beginning of season one, but it feels like it drives him in different directions and he uses those as tools that he's kind of more self-aware of in, in specific ways. And so I was interested in how you've kind of worked to really create that growth in that way where you're still always keeping him true to who he's always been, but kind of directing the character in different ways. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, all credit really goes to the writers because they are the ones who like lay all of that foundation. And it's just, you know, it's that thing where uh, when it's a really good text, it's about getting out of the way of the text as an actor. Like you just want to be there to sort of, you know, hashtag serve it. But I think that with it would have just been boring. I think that there was a notion that if Jamie was then really ad adapted suddenly to the environment, it just wouldn't really make sense, I think, and it would be boring for an audience to watch. But, you know, I kind of think it's like, you know, when you see someone from secondary, from high school uh, that you haven't seen in like 10, 15 years, and you're like, Are you, wow, you've changed, man. You've really changed because they went to university or they were traveling and they found themselves, or whatever. But they're still like, they still have that like element of wit to them, or they still have the same thing that are like those like touchstone personality traits that they have still have that. But it's like, they've just made different choices in their life that mean that they have like, you know, the, the, the sort of icing on top is all different now. And I think with Jamie, I think that I wanted and, and had worked with Jason on, on finding the things that Jamie was still the same person in these situations. He just made different decisions. And so what we saw in season one, we see Danny Rojas turn up, for example, and Jamie feels like in order to, to win this scenario, he has to beat Danny in a sort of one-on-one, -on -one, you know, crossbar challenge thing. And then we see Zaba turn up in season three and he has the same sort of impact on the team. They're all like, wow, this guy's going to be amazing. But rather than Jamie feel like he needs to beat him to win the scenario, he feels like he needs to ingratiate him into the team so that he becomes a sort of functioning member of that 11. And so again, it's like same scenario, but different choices. And, you know, again, it's like, it's how the, the writers have put that scenario there. And it's just then trying to find a way that it still feels, you know, in the Jamie wheelhouse of like his, it's, I still wanted him to be like narcissistic, but, but now in a way that those, those like the assets of narcissism are kind of a bit healthier, like rather than it be like conceitedness and like uh, sort of self-involved, he like he he uses that like looking at himself in a mirror to like have some introspection and learn about himself a little bit from all of these teachers around him from Keeley from Roy and from 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 Ted and others. But yeah, so yeah, we we wanted to make sure that we still kept that. Oh, it's just be weird. You just be like you could see through it. You could see that the rock that you know they're just trying to change the arc without earning it. You know. I mean, the friendship with with Roy, obviously, everyone really kind of cottons onto that dynamic with the two of them. But I love the fact that the two of them still have their own very specific language of affection with each other. It's like Jamie showing up at Uncle's Day. He's excited to be invited, but he's also kind of curious at watching Roy squirm. You know, it's kind of yeah. like, I'm enjoying your discomfort. But then he's bought the most thoughtful gift with foul language. And these are two guys who are never going to outwardly say, I love you, but they have their own way of communicating where even kind of the language of insults that was part of the beginning of, of their dynamic is still there, but expressed in a different way. And so how did you and Brett really work to figure out what is their language of expression with each other with that in mind? Well, I think it's, we sort of have like, I, I suppose in between takes, we would be just dicking about as much as possible. And it would kind of get us to the point when it was probably quite irresponsible to be honest. I'm sure that all of the crew were like, Oh my God, guys, just be professionals. But it, what it meant was that, that it was all, it was always on the cusp of us like corpsing or breaking down, laughing, whatever in the scene. But that also you can, that, the tension between that, that the conflict between not laughing and laughing feels like we could sort of just about <laughs> like finagle it in a way that it feels like, you know, 
punching and not punching each other or like, you know, arguing or not arguing. There's like, we're on the cusp of something. We were just, you know, maybe uh, trying to sort of redistribute that energy from like, I don't know, I would feel sexual tension between me and Brett and uh, and actually just like a sort of, some sort of like frisson between the two of them. Um, I don't know what frisson really means to be honest. It's a bit French, isn't it? But um, some like, yeah, something where there's like, I don't know. That's where the that's where the drama is, isn't it? Conflict between like the two, the two opposing forces, and so whether it was like, you know, it. I don't know if we were sort of so specific about like love languages necessarily when we were doing it, um, but we certainly knew. Again, the writers laid out what the structure of of that relationship was. It was just for us to like put that sort of, I'm gonna say, frisson energy in there. <laughs> And when they're in Amsterdam together and, and Jamie ends up teaching Roy to, to ride a bicycle, it's it's really endearing to watch Jamie in the position of teaching him to do something and having a lot of patience with him and understanding the emotion of where it comes from and what it means to Roy never having learned to ride a bike properly. Um, and so for you, what did that mean to Jamie to be in that position when he's at a point where, you know, in their friendship, Roy's kind of been the one that's really been a mentor and someone who's been teaching him so much to have a moment like that where he can kind of give something in return? Mm. Um. Yeah, I think that there's probably, you know, I've said this once or twice before, but I think that in any sort of functioning relationship, there are two or more people where there is one person is the teacher and one person is the taught. And a functioning relationship is that that can oscillate between who is what, uh, you know. And I think that it's important sometimes to be able to uh, to be the person who is being taught. And I think that for Roy, that was probably a big shift in the relationship. There is someone who the dynamic between the two of them uh, has always been in the ascendancy or the the teacher or whatever. And to see this humility that he has of, uh, and and I actually think that Roy has been good at this throughout with Jamie. He's been the better one at this. In season one, in episode four, when they're at the gala, Roy is sort of, after having been told by Ted to, you know, try to, use the what you have in common with one another to 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 build bridges um he was the one who was leading that in season one and i think that jamie has learned that himself and is trying to now do that in season three um and and so yeah i think that it's it's just like a it's it's a further progression in the two of their relationship that they understand and the thing is as well they go back and forth with it because we see in the final episode that they fight again but I think, again, you know, and, and I've seen some people sort of say, well, that's what's the point? Because we've seen, you know, we've seen Jamie and Roy go on this huge journey together. And I think I understand what they what they mean by that. But I also think that it just speaks to like in the world that they inhabit, the thing is an ongoing thing. And again, it would be boring if it, everything just had a bow on it, you know, in the end. And so I think if there was episode 13, 14, 15, 16, we'd see them come back together again and learn their lessons and try better, try harder and hopefully do better next time. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's just, a, it was an ongoing thing. And I think that the, the bicycle scenes was another example of like, you know, of Roy having the humility and be like, okay, you tell me, you tell me in this. I love that. And especially the idea that you bring up of, you know, it, it can't be a fully absolved journey by the end of, of season three, because that's also not how people exist in the world. No one ev- ever is kind of fully perfect by the end of a, a storyline in their own life. Um, and even just like, well, the line of- speak for yourself, mate. Speak for yourself. <laughs> except for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but but like, God, I love the script it. line at, at, for like the montage at the end for Jamie of like, we see Jamie with James, his dad looking through photos, smiling with one another, not repaired, but they're trying. And so when you see kind of a detail like that in the script, how did that give you an idea of what is the end goal for Jamie at the end of season three, where I want to take him to a certain point, but I want to kind of not create the idea that everything is kind of wrapped up in a bow. There's still work to do, but the foundation is there that wasn't there before. I think that it's it that just that it comes from a place of uh, oh, this sounds. I mean, this this sounds a bit too neat in saying it. So, for want of a better phrase, that that his decisions come from a place of love, um, 
And I think that, you know, it's it's kind of what Ted was saying when they have this in 311, they have this conversation where, you know, he, he says, forgive, you know, Ted says, forgive. And he's like, oh, Jamie's like, I'm not going to give him that. And Ted's like, no, no, don't do it for him, do it for you. And I think that there is, there is like, again, Jamie is, uh, he's learning to act for himself, but to be a better person with other people. It's not just he's learning to act for himself because um, he loves himself and he's the best. It's like, you know, I can be a better version of myself by, you know, but again, it's the, it's the sort of point of the show, I suppose, in that it's like the opportunity to show kindness and be that to yourself or to others. But, um, you know, I think it's that sort of, um, it's that sort of coffee mug phrase where you can't learn, learn, love other people unless you love yourself. And I think that Jamie probably is is moving towards that as best he can. But again, I wanted it still to feel like he was, he ha has the armor of pride. He has the armor of like a little bit of vanity. And um, I think that, so I, I was conscious that he should sort of go into his final form, sort of super Saiyan uh, version of, of Jamie in act in, uh, in season three. Um, but it should still be very much on the foundation of like, he still cares this, his hair's on fleek and, uh, he's like wearing sort of mad clothes, but it's very much him. Yeah. Cause in episode 11, when, when he kind of ha reaches that breaking point, he doesn't even care if his hair's on fleek, he can't even put conditioner in. Um, <laughs> but I, I loved the way that you kind of really stripped Jamie down to such a raw place and even just watching your body language in the press conference where he's kind of just physically holding himself at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so how was that a completely different space to kind of find and discover when you really stripped away that, that kind of sense of ego from a character to a place where he's completely directionless and he doesn't know why he's feeling these emotions, but he's been given enough tools to kind of try to be introspective and try to figure it out. I mean, uh, you know, that, yeah, I, I think, again, it's that, that's the conflict thing where I think it's, it's, it was fun. Like it's really, that was sort of much, uh, I don't know if it's easier, but it's like a lot clearer what, what has to be done because you're not having to, when there's plenty of stuff, there's, there's like a lot of, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of action that Jamie's going through, a lot of emotion that he's going through, an emotional journey there. And it's all, a lot of it's on screen. And so it's for an actor, you know, I mean, you know, a little look behind the magician's curtain, if, if that's what it could be called, where oftentimes you have to bring a lot of work that you have done outside of it for your like one or two lines in a scene. You've got to be thinking about like where the, the characters come from, if they had a fight beforehand or whatever, you know, you can do this stuff. Um, if you sort of have ideas of self-importance like I do. But, uh, you know, I think that it's, when it's all on screen, it's a lot easier just to sort of act, play that. And so in a sense, it was, it was a lot more straightforward to do that stuff. It's a challenging thing because you want to make sure that you get it right. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that there's parts of that which I probably feel a lot more a lot closer to myself than Jamie with his like when he is his full like egoistic self and how like self congratulatory he is and and like like just just re uh, assertive as a person because you know Jamie whilst he made bad decisions his some of his character traits are great as a person that's why Keely loves him that's why you know he has he's sort of like Beanock on the team because like. He kind of is amazing. He's just an arrow that just goes where he wants to go in season one. Whereas in season three, he's a lot more like spread out and a lot more self-doubt. So, you know, in that respect, I can uh, relate to him. And so it's probably a bit easier to do for myself because he's there like um, sort of questioning all of his choices. Um, but so, yeah, I think that there was a, a sort of adversely, there was a, there was sort of much more to go on in those in those episodes and as ever Jason was always on hand to sort of help with a lot of that stuff you know there's a great there's a great joke in season two where he goes so I can go back to being a prick and Jason was like he should like he should like inflate on that moment and then when Roy says no or whoever it says says no I want to see you like like 
I want to poke you and like all the air comes out. And it's those moments where, you know, Jason is so on point and he tells so much story through like physical, whatever. So um, physical, whatever, physical comedy or like, you know, physical storytelling. Um, it's insightful, isn't it? To use the word whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think that he's, he's also such a huge part of that for so many of the brilliant moments in Ted, Jason is at the, at the core of it, of course. And with what you're describing there as well, in terms of the the work that happens off screen and everything that goes into that beforehand, um, you know, that also is a tool that helps you when you have moments where you've got to make very quick decisions in terms of your performance. And, and one of the scenes in particular that I wanted to ask you about with that was whenever you're working in a TV show, you're always getting pages last minute. But the scene where Jamie shows up at Keeley's door to apologize for the leaked video and, and to tell her, you know, I deleted everything off my phone, but I didn't realize it was in my email. And he mm-hmm. feels like he's to blame was something where you didn't have the pages in advance. And so how did all of the work that you'd been doing for that episode and, and at that point off screen really help you to go into a scene like that that's so pivotal for him as a character shows a lot of growth for him and yet you're having to make very instinctive choices in the moment wow you only research that's very interesting yeah yeah that's true yeah uh that was literally like just beforehand so yeah I don't know really I mean I'd say that there's a lot that comes for um there's a lot that comes from just three years of having like lived in a character um so I think that there's 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 choices that you that are just sort of like a lot more sort of in under your skin a bit more. And so there's moments where, for example, where he's like, well, I did I deleted them all. Well, I, you know, most of them or whatever the line is, because he's still like angry. He's still angry and he's still a child. And so like we're guys, we all are. Um, newsflash. But like he's still like he still doesn't really fully know how to deal with it. And I wanted And so like when there's that moment where he says that I, I guess it's a bit more instinctual at that point that he the way that he says that will be like there's anger in there and he doesn't really know how to deal with it and so that I, you know that should come across in his face a little bit um but but also there were there were points at which I'm trying to think specifically now but there were points at which Jamie uh, Jason again was uh he, he gave me somewhere to go with it um and I think that there's always should be like a turning point in the scene I think is generally what people say when you when you approach a scene there should be you should start the scene at a different place from when you end it to um and I think that the bit where he starts really showing contrition and taking responsibility for for what had happened is the big turning point in it and we can sort of see that he's like trepidatious to begin with and then once he says no, 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 it, it, it was my fault. And let me tell you why. Um, we, saw, we sort of see him like grow in stature a little bit because he's like, he, because he backs himself with what is a sort of a, 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 an emotional realisation. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't know how specific I would be able to say the sort of off-screen preparation was other than knowing that this is a scene where Jamie takes responsibility, you know, as a as sort of overall this is a scene where Jamie takes responsibility for it. And I think it was probably then just choosing with Jason at what point he, he is like sticking his flag in the ground and being like, this was my fault and I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, yeah. Um, also Juno Temple is, is probably the best person to do a scene like that with because she, she is just like, I think she's just this is this is a really like basic thing to say but she's so good at listening and making you feel, you know like a th- you know like a therapist someone who is like really good at like showing you that they are hearing what you're saying and then responds in kind she's probably the best one of the best people I've worked with at doing that and so it's really nice when you're going through and also when you're like oh is that the right line is that the right line having her there is like such a safety net um so that was yeah thank god and I would probably just be laughing if I was doing it with Brad. I mean, you know, he'd be very supportive, but we'd be giggling throughout it. And, and with the idea that that's such a, a great moment to kind of show that journey of Jamie taking more responsibility for his own actions and for his own life, you know, Keely feels like she's really been such a pivotal part of teaching him that and kind of teaching him to own up for his own behavior, to apologize for things when he needs to, and to kind of show up in a different way. And so whenever you would have scenes like that, where it would be Jamie and Keely and there's kind of, 
that little like pivotal turning point with that idea that you were talking about every scene, you kind of want to end at a different place. How would you equally look at scenes that he has with Keeley and what he was taking away from that and how that would inform scenes after that and the rest of the episode and who he is moving out of that experience and moment? Yeah, I think I think that, again, it's like there are overall lessons that he learns from her, some by by like description she will literally spell it out to him and other times by you know her behavior her like you know leading by example and you know I think that we see with Sam in season two when he when Jamie you know when he becomes more part of that like of the group I assume that it's stuff you know he, he will what he will have watched Keely interact with with other members of her team and you know we see how she is like in that thing that I said about Juno and that she's very good at like actively listening I think that there is times that we see from Jamie that he learns from that we see that he's like how do I help the people who are around me here because he's, he's learning by her example and so there, there are times when there are like direct references to to a scene between Jamie and Keeley. Um, but I think that he's, you know, again, Jamie is is like, it's just a constant like opening up of the tap of listening and learning from that. And Keely, I think, was the was the person who always did it with love for Jamie, even even in the face of all of his like ridiculous conceitedness. Um, and so I think that he, once he starts opening up that tap of listening and learning, she's the person he's going to learn from the most because she's the one who's been giving to him the most. And so it's like, you know, there's already, there's already that, that sort of dynamic between the two of them. Um, but yeah, she, she, I think, you know, she really acts from, from kindness, I think, Keely. And I think that Jamie, he, you know, I think that Ted is, is probably his greatest sort of uh, intellectual coach I think that Roy is probably his best like physical coach and I think that Keely is probably his best emotional coach and a large part of what Jamie's journey is his emotional coach that is his emotional arc so yeah I think just by sort of good example and being around her um, and I think that they probably just have their 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 choice of clothing and color is probably quite, <laughs> it's both quite gaudy so they probably have they've always had that in common so there was just already that bridge there it's the interior design that brought them together. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Those who pink together stay together. And and with Jamie as a player, you know, looking at episode 12, especially and and the kind of like SB at the you know, Oscar play at the SB's um scene where he's kind of out there being like, give me the ball, give me the ball. I was interested in just going into a filming a scene like that, especially with the fact that you had a specific callback to him having been encouraged to do that specific play in the that in the past and kind of refusing because it wasn't making him front and center. And by the end of of season three, he has the most assists versus the most goals because he's playing from a very different place. And even just with what you were talking about earlier, the the not playing from anger towards his dad, how did you go into the football scenes in episode 12 in a very different space, particularly for a scene like that? Yeah, I suppose that he like, he gets off on a different thing now. Like I almost feel like it would be, I think as you grow older anyway, I think that that just feels like that's something that, that happens more, that you you enjoy being a part of the creation of something rather than you being the sort of forefront of it maybe. And I think that, um, I mean, I say that, me on my birthday, I'm like, guys, let's celebrate me. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, when it comes to those sorts of team scenarios, I think that it's, there's an, it's just an emotional maturity that, that, as a result of that maturity there is just like, I want to be part of the team far more than I want to be the sort of, you know, the focal point. Uh, that being said, he still does it with flair because again, this is Jane, like the foundation of him has to be the same. He still is like, you know, upset. He still wants to argue with referees. He's still, but he's doing it for the team. Um, and I guess it's like, you know, he's being, he's being a prick, but he's being their prick, but in a different role. And so he still gets to exact all of the like 
the ostentatiousness that he has as him as like a foundational tenet of him. But he gets to do that in a way that like, you know, and I think that he also is rewarded not just by like the team welcoming him in more, he's rewarded, you know, we see in the same way that people still applaud him in, in the final episode, in episode 11, he gets a standing ovation at Man City. And so he still gets it, but just in a different way. Um, and so he's still that person, but just doing doing a different thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And overall with the experience of, of playing Jamie throughout these three seasons, you know, kind of going back to what you were talking about at the beginning, where you've been able to kind of drive his motivations and his choices in, in different directions. I, I was interested in that aspect because you get the chance to build such an intimate relationship with the character and to really understand where their decisions and choices are coming from when it comes to choices that you're making in scenes. Um, but did you find that that kind of also really kept you on your toes in a lot of ways because it wasn't, well, he's always going to respond in this way because it depends on where he is in that that journey of, of growth internally. Yeah, I think that th there are certain decisions that come, I think that people maybe give a lot of credit for that perhaps it's not necessarily an active decision. And I don't know, I think sometimes you need the dust to settle to be like, oh yeah, I can see that I, you know, that the, the progression was just there naturally. Um, that, that was sort of an instinctive thing. Um, there are like, and I think that a lot of the work goes into when it's shot, the difficulty comes from more like, obviously, because it's a dark sequence, the difficulty comes from going, okay, so I'm like, in the morning, I'm taking a big step of emotional maturity. And in the afternoon, like, I'm not really doing anything, but I say something where maybe it's a bit more sort of Jamie season two, where it's like a bit snide or whatever. And then you have to, then after that, for the final scene of the day, you're then like, have a big emotional conversation with your mom or whatever it is. Those that it's more like the 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 sort of minutiae is the stuff you have to worry about. And I think that you just let the director and Jason really worry about the overall thing. And you know, you just pick it up. You just know a bit more instinctively. That's just me. I'm sure that there are people who are far smarter and like more active on those things than I am in terms of each day knowing exactly where you know if it's like a hundred percent of like season arc you know starts end okay this is like the growth 65 to 68 percent and then this other scene is like that's actually 51 to like 52 or whatever you know I don't know however people do it or people just say like I can't do math so I don't know, that probably doesn't make sense but but I think there are some people that, that some people's process is probably far more active in that sense but I know, I think that there was also just like, you just, as you read the scripts, you can understand implicitly what's going on with the characters and you just need to be able to some, get out the way of the, get out the way of the, uh, you know, of, of the text and just let it, let it do its thing. Um, and, and also, again, the, it's the directors and Jason who will be able to go, we're looking at the micro of this moment. We're looking at the slightly bigger of the, scene and then we're looking at the macro of the episode and then the season so they are always in you know keeping keeping tabs on that which is a really hard thing and it's a really like impressive thing that directors do that you know that's probably why so far I've predominantly been an actor because I only have enough brain space for, to think about me <laughs> when directors have to think about 25 different things in any one moment so I said that my girlfriend's a director and so she's a lot smarter than I am and so I just don't know how <laughs> she has the, the brain capacity for it. I mean there's there's so many remarkable moments in terms of the minutia and what you've done in your performance um, I think especially building Jamie throughout this this third season so congratulations on an amazing season three and thank you so much Phil I really appreciate it. Thanks dude and thanks for just kicking the word minutia back and forth with me. <laughs> Love that.